Welcome to HIV Hope and Charity, a podcast series brought to you by TVPS, a charity that's been supporting people affected by HIV since 1985. I'm Sarah. And I'm Jess and we work for TVPS and our aim is to get as many people as possible HIV educated. If you like the podcast, please rate, subscribe and leave us a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. I'm going to start this week, Sarah. Hello! And welcome to HIV Hope and Charity, HIV Heroes Edition. Oh my gosh, you're very enthusiastic. I know. Well, I just thought I'd take the lead today. Oh, well, thank you. I know, another week's gone by. Where is the time going? This year has flown by, hasn't it? Just bonkers. Absolutely bonkers. Oh, I did want to say quickly, though, following on from our last podcast last week, thank you, everyone, that sent in their ribbon photos and please do keep sending them in um you'll find out about our ribbon wall on our social media and things like that I won't go through it all again I'm assuming everyone's already listened to the other one do you like that I'm erring on the (laughs) side that there are fans and they're listening every week oh my good I don't think we have any fans maybe my mum hi mum oh yes most definitely and I should give your mum a special mention Jessica because Oh, I can't remember what we were talking about now where I'd said something and she told you that she... Cosmetologist JVN episode. There you go. And she didn't know either. Myself and Bernice are on the same page. You really are. You really are. Well, she'll love the shout out anyway. And she is lovely, isn't she? (laughs) We've talked about your mum quite a bit. Now it's my mum. It's weird, isn't it? Yes. I think the difference is that we talk about your mum very positively because she's this lovely person and she's super supportive. Whereas with my mum, we just diss her sewing skills. (laughs) You're so right. And then you laugh about taking secret Snapchat pictures of her. (laughs) That's never going to get old, though. It's just the best thing to do. (laughs) See, Bernice, count yourself lucky that I am not doing those things to you. This, Oh, this is very true. Yes. Uh, um, I'm not sure that my mum, well, my mum definitely doesn't listen to our podcast. So all's good. Well, one day she's going to find it and she'll be like, your phone will go. And then you'll be like, oh, I'm so sorry. Maybe ring Jess and talk to her about why she said the mean things about the cape sewing. I will do. I'll say she will hunt you down, but in a very slow fashion because not as speedy about mum anymore. <laughs> so who who do we have this week? Oh, I'm going to give you a clue. I know I'm rubbish at this and I just can't wait to tell you, but are you ready for this? Okay. Here's the clue. Ah, I bet you wish you'd record that bit. Bill Collins coming in the air tonight? No, it's the East Enders cliffhanger doofs. Oh, the doof. Doof, 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 doof. Oh, I see what it's yes. so quite hard to do it, isn't it? Very hard to do it. Okay, yeah. Maybe you should have gone in with... Dun, 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 dun. Oh, I'll take competent at sound effects off my uh, yes. <laughs> podcast CV, shall I? So, wait, I totally missed it because you were doing the diffs. What are we doing? <laughs> okay, so my hero this week is Mark Fowler from EastEnders. It's weird. It's a fictional character. How can they be our hero? And in actual fact, it's more that it's the writer and producers of the programme, the BBC, the actors involved in the storyline. They should all be acknowledged for this. But I didn't think you could succinctly put that as the bio for the episode. So I'm doing you a favour. Yeah, that's quite long winded. Okay, so this week's HIV hero is Mark Fowler. It is Mark Fowler. No relation to Lord Fowler from a previous episode. (gasps) Oh, No, but coincidental. Ooh, interesting. All right, I'm going to set the scene for you. Uh, So it's 1991, EastEnders, the biggest, one of the biggest soaps on TV, if not the biggest. And Mark Fowler became the first mainstream soap character to be diagnosed with HIV. But why? Why did they do it? So I was thinking, you know, possible answers. Was it to get the ratings up? Well, if you think about it, that is a risky strategy because stigma around HIV was really strong at the time. So you think, well, maybe they're just all around good eggs and they just wanted to diminish the stigma. But I don't think it was that either. There is, um, this is from Wikipedia. So the actual answer that I could find was because the government asked them to. So Wikipedia says the storyline came at the government's request to spread the word. Now, I can't find any firm references to this. So, you know, which minister requested this or which department 
And, you know, have the government used this method for other issues to raise awareness? But several sources do state this. So, I mean, it could just be an urban myth. But regardless of how it came about, EastEnders took the challenge on board. And what a challenge that is in that time with so much stigma and everything happening and actually kind of a lot of misinformation still flying about. Well, I mean, there still is today. Yes, yes. Maybe East End should look at this again, although other states do now, don't they? So it's much better than it was. Now, I'm going to refresh our memories about the storyline. I mean, you are a massive soap fan. You're glued to Hollyoaks every night. I know you are. I'm, I'm more of a like trash TV fan or awful like crime documentaries. There's no real in between. So <laughs> look, <laughs> we'll refresh our memories. So there's a website called atvtoday.co.uk and they have a Soap World archive. There's no date or authors. We can't give credit, but it does give the story of what happened at the time. So in 1990, viewers saw Mark return to the square, but something seemed to be playing on his mind. There was a shock in store when he eventually confided in his then girlfriend, Diane Butcher, Frank Butcher's daughter. You remember Frank Butcher, Pat and Frank? I remember Pat and Frank, but I just remember Janine. Janine! Oh, well, they say Diane Butcher. Oh, maybe she wasn't. Frank. It wasn't Janine, was it? Because she was Barry. Yeah. That's who Janine was with. Look at us refreshing our memories. Okay, Diane Butcher. Diane Butcher. He confided in her that he was HIV positive. Now, Mark struggled to break the news to his parents, Pauline and Arthur, but eventually dropped the bombshell, is their word, and obviously not mine, on Boxing Day 1991. Now, I'm just going to interject here because, of course, you choose Boxing Day. Why consider any other day of the year and that's the most obvious day of all to tell your parents this news. Boxing Day. Wow. It's like, I'll give him Christmas. That's, it feels like that's what they're doing. And it's like, maybe that shouldn't have been how it was done. No, but that's how they did it. I mean, Diane left Wolford and Mark started visiting his ex-girlfriend, Jill. And she was also, well, it says here, suffering. I wouldn't use that word from HIV. No, they never um, determine who passed the virus on to who but he grew very close to Jill and he married her in 1992 but tragedy struck and Jill died not long after they were married from an AIDS related illness. Mark's HIV remained a recurring story source in EastEnders until his death in 2004. His death in the soap obviously not Todd Carty's death because isn't that's the actor that plays. I love Todd Carty no he's still very much alive I mean he's a real icon from my childhood from Grange Hill I don't really remember him in that because my Grange Hill time is you know Zamo, Roland, heroin <gasps> just say no sing it just say no no <laughs> just say no oh what a tune what a bop Yes. But I do remember, I remember him in Tucker's Luck and I remember him in EastEnders. But what I remember him best for, I don't know if you've ever seen this, he appeared in Dancing on Ice. Oh, I know yeah. what you're going to say. The, the, probably the best moment in the history of Dancing on Ice. Absolutely. He accidentally skates off the rink into the wings and he can't stop himself. It's <laughs> Brilliant. It's all over YouTube. So if you've never seen it, just check it out. It will, it will brighten your day. It really will. But he's done all these amazing acting roles. And that's the first thing that pops into my head. <laughs> Do you know what? Probably present day is the first thing for a lot of people, probably. They, they might not know all this history that we're doing of him playing Mark Fowler. and That's true. Yes. They, they just think he's the dancing on ice guy. <laughs> oh, bless. Now, the storyline story is really well done, and that's because THT um, advised on it. They worked with the producers, and they did do a really good job. And there's one scene I would recommend anyone to watch. And you, you can find these scenes, you know, you can find the programme on, on YouTube. But it's the scene where Mark discloses to his mum and dad. So it's that Boxing Day programme, and he's really struggling to say the letters HIV. And at first, Arthur and Pauline, they don't understand. So he's saying to them, I've got the virus. And they're like, what? And then Arthur says, and he says it in such a horrible way, like, tell us, Mark, what have you done? And you think Mark's going to bottle out of, of telling them, but he doesn't. And then he says, I've got HIV. And they both like, well, what does that mean? And then he says, I'm HIV positive. And Arthur, the penny drops for Arthur then, and he whispers, you've got AIDS. Pauline then realises poor Mark's trying to tell them that he's, he hasn't got AIDS and he keeps yeah. saying, no, no, I've just got the virus. I'm not ill. But that's what they cling on to, the fact that he's got AIDS. That's what they can relate it to. It's actually, it's a really, 
well acted scene and I think at the time I mean it wouldn't have helped to spell any myths about HIV at that stage but it certainly would have captured people's attention. I hope that that would help people relate in some respects so say other parents whose children are coming out to them and saying I'm positive perhaps because I'm hoping what you're going to tell me next if I'm honest is that because I seem to remember Arthur and Pauline accepting things at some point I'm sure you're going to go into that but I hope that some parents were able to look at it and go perhaps that's how I reacted too and it wasn't great to start with but it doesn't mean I can't learn about the virus and I can't turn this around and I can't dispel the myths with other people as well so it's quite a clever way of writing that scene isn't it so Mm. that everyone's represented and it's not just oh yeah we're all so progressive and we all completely understand this right now. Definitely. And they did, I mean, they followed the story up, of course. Arthur, the dad, he struggles the most to come to terms with Mark's diagnosis. And there's a scene where he's bleaching all the cutlery because he's terrified that he's, I know, that he's going to contract the virus himself. But Pauline's, Pauline's the mum, and Mark's sister, Michelle, they help him to understand that he's not at risk himself. The storyline then continues to run in the background, but there are some kind of notable moments. So he meets a new partner. Her name's Shelley. She's uh, his sister's housemate. She makes it very clear she wants to sleep with him. And eventually he tells her he can't. He says, I've got HIV. I can't sleep with you. And she's furious, not because he has HIV, but because he didn't trust her enough to tell her. I mean, that's a new stance, isn't it? But that's so crazy, isn't it? What, you're supposed to meet someone and be like, well, maybe one day we might have sex. So on that off chance, let me just... Craziness. Yeah. I mean, she left. She didn't want to see him again after that. So he's been rejected, but not because he's got HIV, because he didn't disclose to her. hope she was written out. Oh, I think she probably was. (laughs) I mean, let's be clear. It's not the actress's fault. Oh, yeah. No, sorry. Not the actress, just the character, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he then meets someone called Ruth. I remember Ruth. Scottish Ruth. Yes. And he discloses to her and she's very understanding. But her family, they aren't. So Ruth and Mark get married and the family don't give blessing, uh, don't give their blessing for the marriage because he's got HIV. But they're very happy until she realises she wants children. He doesn't because of his HIV. So again, he's putting all these barriers up, really, isn't he, to kind mm. of protect the ones that he loves and, and rightly or wrongly. It's kind of wrecking his relationships. And I suppose these, yeah, these would be reflecting conversations that people might be having within their own relationships that they still do have within their own relationships. Obviously, the situation isn't the same as that. You can have children now if you're positive. Things are different, but I'm sure all the writers were very good, weren't they? Really taking time to reflect on different elements of living with HIV. I know. Yeah, no, they really were. They covered it really, really well. Talking about people um, with HIV having children. When I very first started at TVPS, I literally within my first week, I had um, a guy who was positive who came in to talk to me about having children with his wife. And he was talking about sperm washing. I mean, I've never felt less equipped to have a conversation like that in my life because I didn't know what it was. I didn't understand any of the medical terms, but he just wanted to talk it over. And was it a good thing? Was it a bad thing? Anyway, as it turns out, none of that was needed, um, but shows how long I've worked at TVPS. Yeah. The first week, Jess. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that would be a difficult conversation. I mean, it is hard when, you know, obviously we're support and our experience is around, we obviously we have lots of HIV knowledge. Of course we do, but we aren't medical professionals. So sometimes it is difficult when those things cross over and we have to be honest and say, actually, no, let's go and chat to the clinic. We can do that together. That's fine. But we're not always equipped. And I'm sure in your first week, you definitely weren't. No. Yeah, we both had interesting first weeks. You going off to the immigration centre at Croydon and me talking about sperm being washed. Yeah, maybe that's just like almost like the initiation into TVPS. It's very full on. <laughs> In the first week. Yes. And that's a great way to induct anyone to an organisation. <laughs> Ground running. <laughs> yeah. Single swim. This is how it is. So, oh, so in 1996, the programme kind of moves forward and they start focusing on prejudice towards HIV. So people stop shopping at Mark's fruit and veg stall because they're worried that they're going to catch HIV. And the campaign against him is led by Peggy Mitchell, the landlady <sighs> of the Queen Vic. Oh, Peggy. I know. Now, Pauline, Mark's mum, she sticks up for him and her and Peggy have a fight. I feel this is like true. Not a physical fight. 
Uh, wait, all it, all it says on there is that they had a fight. I think it probably was fisticuffs. I'm going to go and look that up. Oh, you should. And then Peggy kicks him out of, uh, out of the pub for having HIV. So she's <gasps> on a mission. And then he finds someone has graffitied his wall with the words AIDS scum. And at this point, he's like, I've had enough. So he goes, and again, this is true EastEnders style. He goes into the pub. Everyone's there. It's quite packed of an evening. And he talks to everybody publicly about HIV and gives them some HIV facts to educate them and turn the prejudice around. Brave Mark. I mean, that is amazing, but it's not, I'm not, I, 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 I mean, obviously this was a long time ago. It's not necessarily what I'd be saying. Definitely go and get into your local pub right now. Round everyone up. Let's give them some like, better ways to be educated these days. I think there's better ways to talk about your status. Yeah. But it's how EastEnders operate, isn't it? There's been many a conversation in the pub That's true. where people have walked in and said, right, everyone. Imagine, though, because in the pub, obviously, the music always stops and everyone stops talking. Imagine how awkward it would be if you walked in and said that and everyone just carried on. Because I feel like in England, we're quite dismissive. And I feel like actually in an actual pub, we'd all just like turn around a bit and just be like, oh, someone here is just, just a bit bonkers. Like, Oh, I think it's also quite a British thing, isn't it? It's just like, oh, no, this is going to get awkward. <laughs> Let's, let's not engage everyone on their phones <laughs> yeah. look away look away yes. but not in eastenders they go they go against social norms everyone paid attention and then after that i mean lots more happened but it's mainly to do with mark's love life less so to do with his hiv so i won't kind of detail um how everything panned out but in january 2003 mark's doctor told him that his body was rejecting the medication 2003 rejecting the medication he was using to prolong his life and put off the onset of aids he soon accepted he was going to die and decided to leave Walford rather than let his family see that happen he made a tearful farewell to his family and friends and rode off out of albert square it's another classic way of them doing things in February 2003. And the news of his death reached Walford in April 2004. I kind of wish, and this isn't a slight, obviously, on East Ends. I think this is, they've done an amazing job. But I guess I kind of wish they'd dealt with the death as well, rather than just sending him off on a most bye. Yes. Obviously, it was affecting people. People were dying. So it would have been nice, I guess, if they'd have seen that whole journey through. Yeah, I agree. But I think they'd kind of rinsed it for all it was worth. And maybe, you know, more than likely, well, he just left the show, didn't he? So how could they? Oh, actually, that's true. Maybe he had other commitments and actually they couldn't tackle it because the actor couldn't stay in. That's a good point. Look at me just slamming them, being like, guys, why didn't you do this? When actually there may be many, many other reasons. I know. He had a skating career, didn't he, to persevere? Part of me is like, if you're that bad, it almost is a talent in itself. Yes, exactly. You should definitely capitalise on that. Right. Now, whilst I was looking at all of this, I was thinking there must have been other things on television around HIV. There has to have been. It can't just have been solely EastEnders. And if I was very savvy, technically, I would record your face when I tell you about some of the TV instances that we've had. I'm not going to. I'm just going to enjoy them myself. Someone called Simon Simon McCallum. He wrote an online article in February 2021. We'll include the link where he documents where HIV has been mentioned on television. So the first case that he could find was a BBC Horizon special called Killer in the Village. This was in April 1983. Oh, already the grimacing started. So the programme looks at the situation facing gay men in New York's Christopher Street neighbourhood. That's the site of the Stonewall riots from 1969. And it looked at whether Britain was prepared for the epidemic to move over here. After that, there were some broadcasts through Channel 4 and the BBC, but they're not they're not mainstream television. They mainly focus on media scaremongering, comparing AIDS stigma to the persecution of homosexuals. Uh, there was a programme called AIDS the Victims on Thames TV in 1985, which showed Bill Ayres. Now, he was one of the few openly positive people at the time. And it shows him meeting a junior health minister and the minister lets him shake his hand, which I feel is more PR stunt for the minister than for Bill. But that was documented. That's quite impressive for the time, isn't it? As we know, looking at the Princess Diana one that we did, it's quite a big thing at the time for people to see, yeah, a lot of misconceptions back then. Definitely. So we've got, do you remember London Weekend Television? 
Oh, vaguely. Okay, because they had something called Weekend World and they produced several reports, including one called the AIDS Scare. And then the London programme also reported on uh, discrimination against gay people. So they're very much tying it to gay people at the time, which, yeah. you know, as we know now, shouldn't have been the case. Now, get yourself into the brace position because this fact you're not going to like. Yorkshire Television were forced to hire a temporary venue for a September 1985 edition of its discussion programme, Where There's Life, when technicians at its lead studio refused to work with HIV positive guests. <gasps> no, they oh, didn't. There's that face. Ugh. I just don't even have anything to say about that. It's, it's just it's a terrible I know, but a sign of the time. And this is in the 80s. So, you know, we know very well how misinformed people were. I know. And I know it's really easy to sit here now in present day with all the knowledge that we have. But it's still so heartbreaking. (sighs) Yeah. uh, It's horrible. I know. How I feel about it. (laughs) So on the whole, mainly kind of current affairs or magazine type programmes are covering it. There's there's nothing uh, around drama that that he could find. Channel 4. Now, Channel 4 is the most likely channel, isn't it, to cover HIV? And they did. So they did an annual AIDS education programme. It was around World AIDS Day each year for four years, 88 to 92. It was presented by Ruby Wax and Muriel Gray. Muriel Gray, very severe, Scottish, very serious. And they looked at things like latest AIDS research. Uh, They featured personal stories of those living with HIV. But they also looked at issues that weren't being discussed, like women living with HIV or HIV transmission in prisons. Yes, Channel 4. Yes, we, yeah. Always pulling it out of the bag. Well done. And London Weekend Weekend Television, kind of not to be outdone, they did some World AIDS Day editions as well. So they did three later, so between 93 and 95. They were covering in it during a youth magazine show called Speak Easy. So that was kind of studio discussions. Um, and it was mainly focused around encouraging condom use. But they were kind of touching on HIV. And there were some fundraising type programmes as well. So ITV did First Aids in February 87. Is that a play on like First Aid? I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't, know. I just don't understand what, why it would be called First Aids. By January 95, they uh, they were doing something called Live at Lighthouse, which I'm assuming is the, the lighthouse venue that Princess Diana used to visit, I think. Now, there was a children's series um, on ITV. It was called Children's Ward. Oh, I love Children's Ward. Me too. Even though by that time I would have been working, so I'm not sure why I would have watched it. But anyway... <laughs> So in 1993, they featured a storyline about HIV. So Children's Ward is a, is a children's drama set in a fictional hospital. Who is one of the writers of Children's Ward at the time? Is it one of the writers of EastEnders? No. Oh. It's Russell T. Davis. <gasps> no! Yes. I did not see that curveball coming. Oh, okay. Wow. And so was he the one that wrote about HIV? Yes, that, he's done that. He's done that storyline. What a guy. He is, he is amazing. Love him. Oh, I said amazing. I'm not supposed to say that. Well, that's from our last week one, but you can you can say it. I'm just trying to say other words aside from that. You can use breathtaking if you like. Oh. <laughs> I mean, it's, it is amazing, though, because even back then, when he's like a, a kind of junior writer working on, on programs, like that, he's still getting kind of HIV awareness in there. Very clever he's and awesome. actually quite groundbreaking for a children's fictional drama to include something like HIV. That's massively groundbreaking. Do we know what year that was? Did you say? So this Sorry. is 1993, this storyline occurred. That's early. Good for them. Well done. No, very good for them. And that really is about it. There's very few drama programmes that feature HIV. There's one or two, but they're kind of like late night dramas. They're not kind of peak viewing time. And there's definitely nothing as big as EastEnders. So let's finish with the power of the East Ender storyline, because it made a difference. And of course, that's what makes it heroic. So in January 1991, when Mark was diagnosed, the UK saw the biggest peak in requests for testing. That's the effect of having it in programmes and featuring it more and more and talking about it more, is we do see uptakes in testing, when, especially when, when storylines are featured in soaps and things like that, don't we? We see it ourselves. There'll be a huge surge. 
But for that time in 91, that's amazing. Yeah, I know. And Todd Carty, he commented at the time, he said, feel, I feel that the storyline educated people at a time when there were lots of misconceptions about HIV and AIDS. My main concern was that they'd get it right. And overall, I think they did because it showed someone living with HIV as opposed to dying of it. Oh, that circles back to what I was talking. OK, so that yeah. OK, no, I take it all back. Take it back, everyone. Um, the earlier bit. Ignore my rant earlier about why didn't they show the death. I agree. Sorry, my dog joining in with this. I don't. Know I think he agrees too. <laughs> I think he might be a secret Todd Carty fan. He's very like Jess. I disagree with what you're saying. <laughs> Okay, no, I love that. That was the focus. And and it's not, I know it was a big storyline for him, but I liked that the storyline kind of, although it ran alongside, like we were saying, it's just about Mark living his life. Yes. It's not Absolutely. always centred on the HIV. No, and it had an impact. So there's a uh, National AIDS Trust, our friends at NAT, oh. they did a survey in 1999, and they found that teenagers learnt most of their information about HIV from EastEnders. That's fantastic. Yeah. Good job, EastEnders. Well, they, I mean, Mark Fowler, you may be fictional, but the cast, everyone behind the scenes, they're all real. So this podcast episode is a thank you to all of you for making this happen and including HIV as a storyline for the very first time. Oh, well done, everyone. And as ever, well done you, Sarah. Well done us, Jess. No, that was brilliant. And I'm actually, I'm really pleased I know a bit more of the background of how that came about and why they chose certain decisions. Yeah, and everyone go and check out. I think the main takeaway from this is go and check out Todd Carty on Dancing on Ice. And I've got to showcase this episode by singing. Do you know how you need to play us out? I want those doofs and that's the end, okay? We'll do the EastEnders... There's no cliffhanger. This is like we've really summed this up. It's all nice and oh, I can I can do a cliffhanger and you do the diffs. Okay, get ready. Are you ready? Go on them. Next week's HIV hero is. That's not a cliffhanger. Oh, a cliffhanger is like get out of my house. Why is that a cliffhanger? <laughs> oh, actually, that's just a dramatic statement. Let's just do the diffs. Are you ready? I'll do it with you. Ready? Yep. Oh, not quite in time. That'll be a treat for everyone's ears. Thank you for listening to HIV Hope and Charity. If you'd like to know more about the work that we do, visit tvps.org.uk. And please like, subscribe and rate the podcast if you enjoyed it. Hold up. 